Good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to welcome Sarah Shays back to Harvard, and particularly in the context of the MPP1 spring exercise. Uh, in spring exercise, we tried to bring everything you've learned in the year to a point on something dealing with reality. And who better to help us with this than Sarah, who has just stepped off the plane from Kandahar yesterday. Uh, Sarah's job, if we could call it that, is to, uh, to remind you of why the reconstruction of Afghanistan is worth worrying about. By now, you've wrestled with this problem enough that uh, you should have a general feeling about it. So it's not to get a lot of new information, but it's to get the feeling of somebody who's really been there. Uh, Sarah is one wonderful person, a uh, very brave and dedicated woman who uh, uh, many of you may have heard some years ago as an NPR reporter reporting from the Balkans, North Africa, Middle East, and France. Indeed, she won a prize uh, for her reporting on the Kosovo crisis, the 1999 Foreign Press Club Prize and the Sigma Delta Chi Awards for the quality of her work uh, it used to be that wherever there was a problem, there was Sarah, and I guess it's still, uh, still <laughs> true. In any case, uh, she's a graduate of Harvard in history, uh, served in the Peace Corps in Morocco, and she's told me about a year ago that uh, she was going to leave reporting because she wanted to do something, and so she did something. She's helping to run an Afghan not-for-profit organization, Afghans for Civil Society which is based in the former Taliban stronghold of Kandahar, and it sponsors community-to-community -community projects, such as a sister school initiative and rebuilding of houses destroyed during the recent conflict. So Sarah is well positioned, both uh, factually and morally, to describe for us what you've been studying as a set of abstract propositions. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Chase. Thank you very much, Dean and I. It's, uh, it's a privilege to be here and to have you introduce me. Um, I think I, I understand that uh, this spring exercise has been devoted largely to uh, reconstruction and, um, and international aid. I think I'm going to step back a little bit with the, with the following uh, sort of sentence to begin with, which is, Nothing happens in a post-conflict situation in a political vacuum, and that means aid, and it also means security. Um, I think uh, I, I just want to step back from aid a little bit to talk about security, because that's one of the issues um, which has, I mean, it's one of the questions that I get all the time. And I'd start by saying there's, there is some good news in Kandahar, which is that there's an internet cafe, finally, that's open. The bad news is that it's run by the Pakistani intelligence service, the ISI. Um, <laughs> the other day I was there pulling down an article uh, in the Washington Post about, uh, about Kandahar and the governor of Kandahar, which some of you may have seen, and in which I'm quoted. Um, so I'm pulling this down, and one of the Pakistanis comes over and says, Miss Sarah. Now, I had never <laughs> known that these guys knew my name before. You have been quoted in the Washington Post saying some very bad things about the governor. I said, oh, really? <laughs> he says, have you read the article? No. Well, you should look in Google, and you should look at that article. And Mr. Pashtun, the governor's uh, basically factotum, is very angry at you. Uh, this governor is named Gulaha Shirzai, and he is a warlord. You've heard about those, and we're actually living under one of them. And I'll be coming back to him. In other words, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I'm going to say very bad things about the governor again. The United States uh, military, in this case, because those are the Americans who are most visible in Kandahar, works almost exclusively with this warlord. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, and I'll come back around to them. Um, but that means, again, both security-wise and in terms of aid, because he is technically the governor, even though he's also a warlord. And this raises a lot of the issues that I think 
you may have been grappling with over, over the last uh, couple of days, which is to say, if you're delivering aid into a situation, you have a, uh, an official who holds a title, which is an institutional title, which we, re we recognize, Westerners tend to recognize. What do you do with your aid? Do you give it to and through this, uh, this figure? Or do you, on the basis of some calculus, decide that this figure is bad for his own society and that by reinforcing him, uh, by funneling aid to him, you're actually perhaps doing more harm than good? It's a question uh, that's a really difficult one. Um, but let me just go through a, a story. About three weeks ago, I think, maybe a little more, uh, a worker with the International Committee of the Red Cross was quite nastily ambushed and um, assassinated north of Kandahar on the main road leading to an extremely poor and isolated province to the northwest called Uruzgan. And this guy, I mean, it was a classic. The guy was, he was in a two-car convoy. The convoy was pulled aside. Uh, he was hauled out. Uh, the folks who ambushed the convoy made a phone call. There are four people in the car, three Afghans and one foreigner. Do you want four people killed or one person killed? The answer comes back, we want one person killed, and the guy is shot against the side of the car. Um, now, I looked into this, naturally, um, and there's some really interesting details about this whole story. It is a case, I mean, a lot of people, as I say, talk about the security situation in Kandahar. It's not as bad as uh, it may seem from here. However, there clearly is an uptick in what we would consider extremist or Taliban-related activity. But even that takes some analysis. The people who perpetrated this came in from Pakistan about a week prior to the assassination. They were immediately picked up. In other words, they didn't you know, it, it's very difficult actually to hide in a country like Afghanistan. It's not, uh, although it's a rugged, I guess this is the only one that's working, so I'll lean over this one. Um, it's a rugged and forbidding landscape and all of that. In a way, that makes it even harder to hide in because there are very few roads and because villagers know everybody in their village. They know everybody in the area. And this was something like a couple hundred armed militants infiltrated in from Pakistan who had been training in training camps, the same ones that, that the United States military, military chased out of Afghanistan are now just over the border in Afghanistan. Um, and they showed up in, in this region, which is right on the border between two provinces. And it's, it's a, in a lawless region, it's a particularly lawless zone because it's a border zone. Um, a number of people, as I said, picked up the arrival of a couple of hundred armed militants, naturally. Uh, one person that I know uh, called down to Kandahar to a security official and said, look, there's a bunch of people shown up here. Um, you guys should get something going from Kandahar, you know, some kind of a expedition to, to chase them out. That person went to the governor. The governor said, yeah, we'll see about it next week. By next week, the ICRC uh, employee had been, had been killed. Um, another person I know actually infiltrated the group and knew quite a bit about them. But again, because, uh, because of the governor's uh, stranglehold on m most of the security services, uh, the person I know was not able himself to send men up to do anything about it. Um, the people involved come from the governor's tribe. The Pashtun ethnic group is divided into two main branches, and those two main branches are divided into a number of different tribes. Kandahar, the power in Kandahar is largely uh, held by three different tribes at the moment, and you really have to know this. I mean, this is the kind of detail that makes delivering both security and assistance um, meaningful. If you don't know who you're giving it to, giving aid to, if you don't know who you're working with when you're doing security operations, you make a muddle of it. 
this, uh, this group was from the Barakzai tribe, there's absolutely no way the governor didn't know that they were coming in. I mean, this is, this, is, this is how things work. He's the leader of that tribe. There's no way he didn't know these people were coming in. Or once they were there, there's no way he couldn't have infiltrated them. Easy, because of the tribal affiliations and, and uh, the way people know each other. Um, so that's the incident. The lesson, the, the, the analysis is that working with this particular warlord, and I would say warlords in general in, in Afghanistan, is not just a kind of expedient, as you may have, have heard, uh, that, oh, well, we had, to, we had to work with warlords during the war against the Taliban uh, because there was nobody else around, there was nobody else who, who, who was armed, who could fight, et cetera. And, you know, now we're still working with them because, you know, because relationships were allowed to continue. Um, it's not just a sort of inconvenient, oh gosh, you know, it's really ugly out there in the real world. You do have to work with bad guys sometimes. It's actually counterproductive. Um, and let me explain why in, in a couple of points. One is that the warlord's interest is bound up in continued lawlessness in a continued level of extremist activity because their livelihood is bound up in that. They, they get paid for going out on operations. Uh, they get paid by the Americans. So they want to go out on operations and they want to catch enough people to satisfy the Americans, but not quite enough to turn off the spigot. Uh, also, a degree of lawlessness allows for a degree of, of predatory behavior on the part of warlords and their, and their uh, henchmen, which is absolutely visible in Kandahar. I've, I've held focus groups with kids, with lawyer jirga delegates, with a variety of different kinds of uh, groups in the city, and people can point out which are the soldiers who are shooting somebody's cousin in order to steal his bicycle, shooting uh, the driver of a wedding procession because he wouldn't give them any candy, um, going into people's houses and looting their houses under pretext of searching for arms. And you know, I will ask people, what uniform were these soldiers wearing? They were wearing US Army fatigues because we clothe the soldiers of this governor, Gulaha Shirzai. There are three or four other security forces. These are the worst, and these happen to be the ones that we're working with, and they're wearing US Army fatigues. Um, and they're, they're completely visible. So uh, two, two points there. One is that uh, this degree of lawlessness allows for the continuing looting and, and, and fringe behavior by uh, people in quote unquote government uniform, A. B, American policy is being linked in the eyes of Afghans with these very sort of the very worst example of what Afghan society can turn into when, when it's not structured. Uh, and this interest, this sort of economic interest in lawlessness is so strong that I believe there's not a lot of possibility to educate these warlords, to, to convince them to behave differently. They've got no economic interest in behaving differently. Um, second point is these guys have um, years and decades of experience in working uh, benefactors. I mean, and this goes all the way, sorry, this goes all the way back to the 19th century and the great game and the British and the Russians and Afghans are very good at playing their patrons off one against the other. So uh, let's take a look at the ICRC murder in this context. Uh, Gulah Hashirzai, the governor, uh, responded once the ICRC guy had been killed, responded with great bombast, big uh, addresses on the radio about how we're going to kick all the Taliban out of government and we're going to do this and that. He sent 900 troops up to the area. But if you look, you know, and, and, and a number of American um, officials who were observing events took this at face value. 
um, if you look a little bit more closely, as I said, he knew days before the murder took place that there was a militant group heavily armed in, in the region in question. Uh, even when he did move, he moved almost 24 hours after the murder. Uh, in Afghanistan, that means an open invitation to people to escape. So what he's doing is he is on the one hand uh, appearing to uh, prove his anti-Taliban, anti-extremist bona fides in such a way as to um, uh, satisfy the Americans one set of patrons, while at the same time, uh, and I don't know this for a fact, but the deduction is, I mean, the evidence is strong enough to make me believe it, uh, satisfying those Pakistanis with whom he works that, uh, let, sorry, let me see how to put this, uh, allowing, basically allowing the militants to do what they were sent in to do, which, which was coming from Pakistan, which is a country that the that the governor works with. I actually didn't I didn't bring that up in the beginning. Um, that he also is a well known Pakistani uh, agent is maybe a bit strong collaborator. He has worked very closely with the Pakistani uh, intelligence services. Um, the third point. The third reason that this, that this strategy of using warlords is counterproductive is that the population opts out. And uh, what I mean is this. They're being faced with a uh, choice, with an alternative. One is religious extremists, the Taliban and their sympathizers, and the other is the warlords, because the warlords are reaping all the benefit of the reconstruction process. Um, they're reaping it in wages in this security field, as I've just been mentioning. They're reaping it because most of the international aid is being funneled through people like Governor uh, Gulag Hashirzai. He is using that money to consolidate his own power. That means buying the allegiance of his own uh, people, in a sense. That leaves the rest of the population kind of uh, stuck. They've got, you know, it's like, Either it's going to be the Taliban or it's going to be the warlords, and both are equally hostile to the interests of the ordinary population. So why should the population, why should ordinary people stick their necks out to inform on Taliban if the person who's going to get the benefit is going to be someone who will oppress them at least as, um, as harshly as the Taliban did? So what you have now is the population which knows the countryside, which knows the villages, which knows, which knew immediately when there was an infiltration of several hundred armed militants, they go back into their houses and close their doors and don't say anything. Um, and the fourth uh, point is, as I, as I just mentioned, in this particular case, Pakistan. Um, Gulag Hashirzai, as I said, is notoriously linked to Pakistan, and it is likely that he became governor in a way as a payoff for Pakistan playing along with uh, the anti-terror coalition, that basically Pakistan said, okay, this is, what, this is one of the paybacks that we want. Pakistan is, has, over the last couple of decades, used extremism as a tool in a regional tactical equation. Um, and that means, the ta that means uh, extreme factions in the fight against the Soviet Union, it means the Taliban, it means extremists in Kashmir, and now it means extremists in Afghanistan yet again as a tool to destabilize the country. Um, now, these extremists who are coming back in may well have a bin Laden-style Islamist international agenda. Um, Pakistan doesn't. Pakistan has a regional tactical agenda, and these, uh, these people are the foot soldiers. And there is every evidence that they're actually on uh, salary. Uh, they are hanging around Quetta, which is the town closest to the Afghan border in the south there. Um, very well healed, uh, as though they're waiting. As though they're waiting. Um, and the final point on that is, uh, 
that, again, in terms of US policy, up until now, with the exception of maybe Mullah Omar, American policy hasn't been that interested in the Taliban. Americans are much more interested in Al-Qaeda. They're interested in Osama bin Laden. Uh, Pakistan, by contrast, is not so interested in Al-Qaeda because it was once Al-Qaeda uh, uh, kind of fused itself with the Taliban. Al-Qaeda having its own very much internationalist agenda that pulled the Taliban out of Pakistan's orbit and made the Taliban, uh, 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 brought them out of Pakistan's control. Al-Qaeda has too much of its own agenda to be useful in Pakistan's effort simply to destabilize Afghanistan. So what you have happening now is that basically Pakistan is turning over Al-Qaeda people in dribs and drabs, like uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was the, was the most recent one. And I, I could see the impact that was having on US policymakers. Immediately, it became impossible to criticize Pakistan in any way. Uh, because, oh, they had just turned over this guy. Meanwhile, Pakistan is actually running training camps. The Pakistani army is running training camps from which uh, militants are infiltrating into Afghanistan and perpetrating the kind of crimes that, that, wa la that, uh, uh, that was perpetrated against the ICRC worker. So I think I'll stop there, actually, and open the door to questions. There are, there are basically two directions that conclusions could go in. One is that I could almost make this whole same argument uh, focusing on reconstruction. In other words, given this kind of uh, context, how do you then channel reconstruction dollars? And what's been happening up until now has been a kind of fig leaf or a shortcut where uh, people like USAID uh, say, well, Governor Gulag Hashirzai is the governor, after all, and we're here to shore up governing institutions, so we will basically run most of our money through him. Without looking at how, is, how did this person become governor? How is he perceived by the Afghan population? Um, how is he truly perceived by the central government? Things like, without really asking those questions, that's one direction we can go in. The other direction is to look at the military as policymakers, because as I said, the largest visible presence of Americans on the ground in Kandahar is military. And uh, the military de facto are making policy. Uh, by working with Gulag Hashirzai's men, they are having an enormous impact on the political structure and makeup of southern Afghanistan. And what's, what's interesting is that a lot of the analysis I just handed to you, found its way into the hands of the uh, general who is in command of the US forces in Afghanistan. And an even harsher version, I would say. And rather than making me collateral damage, which is <laughs> what one might have expected, he invited me to come see him. And we spent a couple of hours together. And then he sent me to the commander of the, of the base in, uh, in Kandahar. These guys are listening, in fact. I mean, they really listened to what I had to say. I think the problem is they didn't, they don't really realize they're making policy. And so they don't take in the kind of, or they hadn't been taking in the kind of information that you need to in order to make good policy decisions like, who's in whose tribe, and this village is from what tribe, and this guy, who was he linked with before, and this kind of very personal, very precise information. And now that they've kind of been alerted to it, they are, they are actually listening. So I guess the point is um, that in Iraq, it would be nice if somebody would get to them a little bit sooner, maybe not 18 months later. Thank you very much, Sarah. For questions, we have uh, mics on the floor, two on the staircase. I'd like the first three or four questions to be MPP ones who are engaged in spring exercise before we throw it open. So, uh, and also introduce yourself to Sarah. Tell us who you are. 
Hi, my name's Bridger McGaw. I'm not a freshman at the college. Um, Um, my, my question uh, is specifically along these lines. Uh, I'm glad that you had these conversations with the Special Forces, but Rumsfeld's announced that we may be moving into phase four of pulling all our forces out, and it's no longer a military action, and we're strictly in a um, reconstruction environment. And as your story um, portrays, that's not necessarily a good thing, and there is a role for security, and we're not necessarily in a secure state. Um, but the problem that we're grappling with in spring exercise is that the role of the D, uh, President Karzai's DDR proposal and whether or not that actually is going to be able to be implemented on time, an effective method of uh, eliminating the warlords as, a, as an obstacle towards um, an effective government. And so I was wondering if, if uh, have your group been approached or is there an effort already underway for using the you know fifty million dollars and the and the rest of the aid that's being funneled towards UNAMA and the DDR process and whether or not you see uh, DDR actually being the foundation of us getting out into a secure environment for reconstruction. Uh, excellent question. I think DDR is absolutely crucial. Um, DDR meaning dis for those of you who aren't doing the spring exercises is disarmament. Uh, what is it? Disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Meaning all these private militias need to have their guns taken away and their uniforms taken away in particular and somehow get reintegrated back into ordinary society. Um, I think it's been extraordinarily slow having having covered I spent a lot of time in Kosovo and I and I covered the uh, basically DDR negotiations there with the Kosovo Liberation Army and I know that's a, a precedent that it's a it's a mixed precedent um, but what I found really interesting I mean we could have a whole conversation about Kosovo which which would be off topic but what I found really interesting in that case was the enormous international will that went into uh, the notion of disarming the KLA and getting something for them to do to the point that the commander in chief of NATO flew into Pristina when the when the negotiations bogged down and and um, you know, sorted it out. I mean, it was that important. It was deemed to be that important. I think in, in Afghanistan, it is maybe the most important issue, uh, again, in focus groups and all the discussions that we have uh, with uh, either citizens, just ordinary citizens, with lawyer Jirga delegates, with tribal elders, it's unanimous. Everyone believes that until you disarm, basically nothing else matters. Um, now, there's the usual problem of, uh, a, a, so what I would say is I'm quite disappointed at the lack of international push on this issue. Um, it was in the Bonn Agreement that all military units should be withdrawn from Kabul. That has not happened. Um, and here we are, as I say, working, again, to look a little bit more closely at the Kandahar situation. Um, Gulaha imposed himself as governor. Uh, President Karzai did not want to appoint him governor, but Gulaha went into the city shooting, and, and, and President Karzai did not want a bloodbath in Kandahar, so he named him governor. He deliberately did not give the governor control over the legitimate security forces, meaning the police, intelligence, and the army. What the governor did was create his own security force, which means it's a private militia. That's the one U.S. soldiers are working with. Uh, so rather than disarming them, we're actually paying them. Um, so to be the first answer is I'm very disappointed that there has not been more international effort uh, focused on the DDR process. Secondly, I, th I think the DDR process needs to be a relatively structured one. In other words, if you are going to convince people to take off uniforms and, and put down guns, which are not only their source of livelihood, but also a lot of their source of identity and pride, and we're dealing with a very uh, bellicose and masculine society, um, you know, one of the, one of the ideas that, that was tried in Kosovo was to 
transform some of these people into a uniformed uh, organi civilian organization, but with a certain esprit de corps. Now, again, we could have a discussion about how successful that is, that was in Kosovo, but I think the idea is not a bad one. And I think there are a number of major infrastructure projects that should have been gotten underway you know, a year ago, which haven't been gotten underway, chiefly the roads. If you've got guys, you know, you turn them into Peace Corps. In, in Farsi is Askar uh, al You could call them, the you know, the peace soldiers. Um, give them uniforms and pump up their ego that, they're, that they are rebuilding the country and all this kind of thing. I think, you know, that's an idea that I haven't heard um, really being, being, bandied about that much. Instead, most of the decision makers I've been talking to, in particular Afghans, but, but uh, Americans also, seem to believe in the sort of free market, uh, free market DDR. In other words, find jobs for people and they will voluntarily leave the army and, and, and uh, take these jobs. I don't see it happening. I think it needs to be a much more structured process. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Beckwith. I'm uh, an MPP1 involved in spring exercise. My question relates to your description of sort of the military just starting to take notice that there was a, a political role for it in, in Reconstruction. It seems like that sort of came about more or less by dumb luck. But domestically, uh, I guess, what levers of control exist to really bring the military into the Reconstruction process in Afghanistan? And what kind of role can the US military play in that Reconstruction process? cooperating and collaborating with relief organizations, et cetera? Uh, that's a really tough one. And it's tough because of the relief, of the attitude of the relief agencies on the ground. Um, there is a virulent anti-Americanism in Kandahar, not on the part of the Afghans, but on the part of, interna of the international assistance community, to the point that we, in fact, who do speak to people in uniform and actually even had two reserve, reserve engineers training a bunch of kids in vocational uh, activities are ostracized by the rest of the international aid community because we talk to the soldiers. Um, so that's loosened up a little bit, but the international assistance community is allergic to the notion of the US military uh, taking an active role in reconstruction. I happen to think they're wrong, but that, that is a, a phenomenon that has to be dealt with. I find that the civil affairs teams uh, that are working out in the villages are actually doing a very good job. Now, part of the problem, I think, is, um, or, or a problem with the way aid is being delivered there too. One is that the civil affairs teams, I don't think, paid very much attention to who they were delivering aid to. For example, uh, the governor's brother, who is in charge of security, uh, sorry, the governor's brother is in charge of security for the US air base. He has a compound on the US base bidding conferences for, um, for reconstruction projects are carried out in his compound. Those kinds, again, these are the kinds of things that you have to be alert to. You have to understand what that means in the context on the ground. That means that it's just going to be their people who get, you know, who get the jobs and most likely most of the villages where the work is being done will also be Gula Hashirzai's villages. Um, uh, so that's, that's one problem. A second problem has been the, what I, what I feel and what a num number of civil affairs officers also feel to be a, an overemphasis on very quick, very cheap projects like rebuilding a school. It's mostly schools, clinics, yeah, m schools and clinics, very occasionally a culvert or something like that. The Afghans were expecting, you know, they saw 5,000 U.S. soldiers and they've got a road leading to Kabul that I can't even begin to describe. It used to be a six-hour drive. That meant you could get to Kabul and watch a movie and come back down. That meant you could get your grapes to market in Kabul. Uh, and you're not to mention your raisins and your, and your almonds and things like that. It's now 18 hours in a truck. That means for all intents and purposes, economically, Kabul is no longer a market for Kandahar. And Kandahar is left begging Pakistan to buy its, uh, buy its produce. People expected the soldiers to be building the road. You know, they, the, the, the people on the ground 
definitely expected uh, U.S. military personnel to be much more involved in reconstruction than they have been. So you're stuck as a policymaker with competing or conflicting expectations on the ground. On the part of the, of the people, the, the people that you're trying to help, uh, the Afghans, they want more. On the part of the internationals, they want less, the international humanitarian, uh, humanitarian community. And then you've got the Pentagon, which says, hey, we're not bridge builders, we're, you know, we're Taliban hunters. So that, you know, what do we, we know? What, you know so it's, it's with quite some reluctance, in fact, that the Pentagon even accepts this role of being part and parcel of the reconstruction process. I'm not sure that answered anything. <laughs> Um, my name is PJ Caceres, MPP1 from California. Um, my question is, you, you just gave us a vivid picture and we actually watched the video of, of your experience in Kandahar. Are we to generalize that the experience in Kandahar with the aid is happening throughout the country? Um, or, and is there such a thing as a benevolent warlord? And is there any place that we could actually send aid and know that it's actually going to benefit the people? Yeah. That's, that's the real scary one, because I don't want the conclusion here to be, you know, humanitarian aid doesn't, isn't worth giving. Um, I, think, I think the conclusion that I want people to draw is that it has to be given carefully, and it's up to the people on the ground not to shirk their responsibility to understand the you know, to actually get down there in the oak tree roots and understand the, the situation before delivering aid. I do think that our experience is quite, is quite applicable. Now, that's just a guess, um, but I suspect that it's quite similar. Um, there are some places where there's more of a civil society uh, than, than in Kandahar. As far as benevolent warlords are concerned, the best candidate is the guy called Ismail Khan, who's in Herat, and who actually apparently has used a lot of the money that's come to him, including customs money, to rebuild the province and things like that. The problem with him is he really is a dictator. He has sole control of the region um, and has committed, all of them commit human rights abuses, but, but he commits quite a lot and he's just squashed any kind of dissent or debate in, in the community and he's very closely linked to Iran. So I do not believe, I actually do not believe in the benevolent warlord thesis and the notion that, oh, well, if we work with them for a while and we work with them for long enough, they'll see that our expectations are this and they'll slowly, slowly start to clean up their act. Um, I think these guys should be removed. I think, um, not to mention the fact that they're all war criminals, you know. Um, hello, my name is Jeff Masters. I'm from the UK, MPP1. My question follows uh, from what PJ was asking, um, which is that I really only know the name of one regular person um, in Afghanistan, and that's uh, Haji Baba. Um, right. <laughs> and I was just curious as to whether the other houses in the village that you plan to build got built, and uh, if you wanted to comment on, on your experience. Yeah, it's a really interesting uh, kind of sequel. Uh, all the houses got built, um, and then, yeah. <laughs> as, as my sister Eve, who's here, who's our U.S. coordinator, said, it just about killed us, but we got, <laughs> you know, but we got the houses built. Um, then what happened was as follows. The headman of the village, who is a notoriously greedy fellow, uh, expected us to build him a receiving room, a kind of guest room, out of burn brick and cement. And we said no. We said, first of all, we didn't have any more budget. Second of all, his house was not damaged by the bombing, and this was about repairing those houses that were damaged in the bombing. And so he told us we couldn't come back. So we had been working, we have an income generation project with women, uh, which focuses on this kind of embroidery, which is very, uh, traditional Afghan embroidery, uh, Kandahari embroidery, and we were working with his, in, his women in particular. We were working with his family, and he said we couldn't come back. 
And so we sort of tearfully said goodbye to the, I mean, we had a long session with the women and they, first they begged us to make the room and then when we talked to them some more, they said, he's crazy, he's so horrible. And then it turns out he beats them and he, you know, and all this kind of thing. And, and one of them, who's also the best embroiderer, actually was a good coalition builder. She went in herself to talk to him, then she got all of his wives in to talk to him, then she got all of the husbands of all the women in to talk to him, and nothing doing. And so we said, we're really sorry, but we can't, we can't um, give in to that kind of blackmail. That's one sequel. The next sequel is that this story of the stone found its way into the Washington Post article that I mentioned to you at the beginning of this talk. The day after that article appeared, um, bulldozers showed up at that quarry and bulldozed dirt into the place where uh, Haji Abdullah, the stone quarry guy, was still extracting stone in order to make gravel. He was still allowed to sell gravel, just not foundation stone. So they have now completely walled up his side of the quarry and he's not allowed to work there at all anymore. So there's, you know, I mean, I feel pretty badly about that because it's not my livelihood. I mean, it was easy for me to make a point in a newspaper article, and I hope that that will eventually um, lead to better things. But in the short run, he's the one who's suffering, and that's what often happens in these cases. Hi, Sean Davis, MPP1. If the warlords and their forces were to disappear tomorrow, uh, would there be a security vacuum, and who would fill it? given the current size of the Afghan National Army, which is pretty darn small, and also the fairly small size of the international force, 40, 4,500 compared with, say, 30,000 in Kosovo? Um, first of all, I actually think the warlords and their, and their militias are creating the security problem. I don't buy the argument that they are providing a modicum of security. I actually think they're the ones who are creating the insecurity. So that's one answer. And the second answer is, of course, they wouldn't just disappear. You would replace, I mean, again, in a, a country, as fledgling a country as it is, you can't remove a governor without replacing him with somebody else. And, and this would be a step-by-step -step process. So I don't actually see there being a, a, a major security problem. But if I, if I could just follow up uh, sure. quickly, uh, who ultimately then will provide the security across Afghanistan um, if, if the army is, is only, only has three brigades after uh, a year? Uh, I think there, there are a couple of answers to that. One is that not all security forces are private militias. For example, in Kandahar, there is a police force run by a relatively decent guy. Now, he is also a former commander. Uh, and a lot of his force is loyal to him personally, but he is looking specific. First of all, he's been begging for civilian police training for a year and a half. And, you know, the, the supposedly Germany was going to be in charge of, of police, and I think they've been working in Kabul in a similar way uh, as the National Army, uh, trying to build a kind of national police force. But here's a guy who's saying, I've got a bunch of fighters on my hand. I want to turn them into cops. Please help me, you know. And and again, there has not been that much. There's been zero assistance forthcoming. But he's thinking in the right direction. He's also thinking about how to reassign, uh, you know, the sub, the district commanders, and their men, so as to break up the personal loyalty aspect of the police department. I'm sure he's not the only person in the entire country who's, who's doing that. And so I think, you know, first of all, you start by using the legitimate security forces that do exist, even if they're not yet up to the caliber of what the Afghan National Army is supposed to be. You, you move out of the equation the private militias. And as I said, in Kandahar anyway, there's a private militia and there's three legitimate security forces. You start, you know, uh, assigning the legitimate security forces to those tasks. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Cunningham and I'm also a first year student. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about completing roads connecting the major cities in Afghanistan. And uh, my group has been sort of concerned that doing that might actually strengthen warlords to the extent that if you increase the ability uh, for local people who, you know, are taxed or responsible in some way to the warlord uh, financial, uh, financially to trade with other cities, it might, you know, increase them economically, increase their power, increase their control over the region. 
course, the counter to that is that if you increase road travel and ease of road travel, you know, security forces from the National Army could move around more easily, or it would be easier to introduce uh, and move around humanitarian aid and employment opportunities. Could you take sides with yeah. that argument for me? I strongly feel that um, building the roads will increase the security, increase security and will reduce the power of warlords because, uh, first of all, it will be easier to travel. Um, it will be easier to get to an incident if there is an incident. Um, and then, uh, as you mentioned, the economic opportunities will basically shore up the civil society because the, the more economic opportunities there are, the more trade that can actually move, the harder it is for the warlords to kind of bottle it off. And they will tax it until they're removed. They will tax it. But still, it's easier to even pay the tax and, then, and, and survive uh, if it's a six-hour drive that costs X amount of money as opposed to an 18-hour drive that costs three or four or ten times as much. Um, and it just is harder, I think, for warlords to keep a stranglehold. The more people can move around, the more they can interact with each other, the more they realize that their grievances are similar, the more likely they may be also to unite rather than to allow their tribal and ethnic differences to be exploited by warlords. Uh, I strongly feel that that uh, building the roads would have a positive impact. If I may, do you, Please. Th do you think the warlords will resist road construction for that reason? Uh, I think it's hard to. What's interesting, what's happening in Kandahar is Gulaha himself is building roads, but he's only building the roads like right in front of his a residence. He's now done it twice. There's a road directly in front, in front of where he's living. He's now repaved that twice. Right around the corner is the road leading to the hospital, which is like a washboard. You know, it's like, you know. And then he also is working on a road from Kandahar to a tiny village called uh, Khakrez, which is a sacred village that had a, like a, the mausoleum of a, of a holy person and was bombed in the American bombing. And um, so he got a lot of money spent on it because it's symbolic and all that kind of thing. And, and he is paving the road up to that village, which has zero economic or developmental interest whatsoever, you know. So I wouldn't say that they would block it, but they certainly aren't uh, contributing to it. I mean, he could easily have done a stretch of the road to Kabul if he wanted to help his province. Thanks. Rowan Wagner, the International Federation of Red Cross, Central Asia region and Afghanistan. Um, as we talk about do no harm, and I'm struggling as to develop programming and some of those issues, um, I, I've only been dealing with northern Afghanistan and the Tajik border so, so far, as you know, the ICRC is that's their area. And as we look at transitioning periods, how effective has been our aid in helping some of the most vulnerable receive medicine and uh, things to assist their ability to cope? Our aid meaning the, uh, Red the Cross? Federa yeah, Federation of the Red Cross. And Federation, I haven't seen that much. Uh, ICRC... They're, they're part of the International okay. Federation. ICRC zero, quite frankly. I've been, now I've heard great things about ICRC during the Taliban time and other times when nobody else was there, ICRC was there. ICRC, I mean, I hate to be uh, tough, but um, from what I understand, their sole mandate in Kandahar, and I, I, again, I only speak from what I know, but their sole mandate in Kandahar has been prison visiting. And so they're basically visiting the Taliban prisoners on the base. Um, I don't know if you rem any of you remember, there was a really nasty um, uh, mistake, military mistake, which was the strafing of a wedding party up in Derawat, uh, which is north of Kandahar. I drove up there with a truckload of medical supplies, which I got from ICRC, but only after beating down their door. I mean, I could not believe it because we had, you know, pretty horrific casualty figures were coming in. And, you know, basically I wanted to get some stuff up there. Um, and I remember, you know, basically the, the line of the person, of the uh, 
head of the station in Kandahar was, oh, well, we help the hospital in Kandahar, so any bad cases will come to the hospital and that'll be fine. It's a nine hour drive at the best of time over appalling terrain. You know, and so even that way of thinking, I was shocked. And it was very much sort of, we don't do windows. Um, in the end, since I was going up, I did get, you know, tons of, tons of stuff. I got enough boxes to put in a, in a four wheel drive vehicle and drove it up there. But they're not visible at all. Hi, my name is uh, Aaron Weisner. I'm also MPP1. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Thank you. We, I've, in regarding the upcoming uh, constitutional process in the 2004 elections, do you, one of the things that was stated in the film is really not seeing too much of a difference between the Taliban and the warlords in terms of the day-to-day -day process of the, of the um, average person. But is there much hope that's being held for the, the um, legislative process and whatnot that, that's going to unfold? And what role do you see for the international community along those lines? That's wild because I know the constitutional process is absorbing everyone's attention in Kabul and a lot of attention here insofar as there is attention. Out down in Kandahar, it's like it doesn't exist. The process doesn't even exist. Partly, no one really knows what it's going to be elections for yet. Um, it's not clear whether it's going to be elections for direct elections for a legislature or a lawyer jurga again or you know all of this is still very vague and so it's very hard for people to get their heads around it when nobody can really tell them what it's about yet uh, that's one issue um, a second issue is the registration process is going to be very uh, difficult and uh, a group called the International Federation of Elections came down and I kind of um, trotted them around town and they were talking about you know like registration cards with pictures on them and things like that to make sure there's no fraud and all that and I said well you know what you can't possibly have a, a registration cards with pictures for women they said what I said it's impossible to have pictures of women it's just not well even if it's a woman who takes a picture I said I can't take pictures of our women that we work with every day so these again are the kinds of realities that I think it's really hard for us to get our heads around and that means that the whole process again needs to be thought out very close to the ground um, the next problem is fear and the role of fear in the political landscape in Afghanistan as you can imagine it's a traumatized country, and that means that people, I'm just overwhelmed by how intimidated people are. Um, and, you know, the comment to me at this internet cafe was definitely intended to intimidate me, and it doesn't bother me, but if I had been Afghan, uh, and some of our people have come under pressure, and it really makes them want to change their behavior. And so, um, I, we've also been accused of working against the king. That's the latest, pa you know, kind of catchword for doing something the governor doesn't like. The governor is now wrapping himself in the cloak of the king, um, and uh, so and the king is still an extremely popular figure. So if you're accused of working against the king, that's pretty. B Again, for me. I don't mind. I'm not, I haven't ever used the king's name in any, uh, one way or the other in any pro project that, that we've done. But it's something that can deter Afghans. And so uh, this goes back to the DDR question that uh, and is so long as the guns are still very visible, I see problems for the electoral process. Now that's not to say that you know, I mean, the Loya Jirga process was, was an electoral process. It was flawed, but I think it was pretty extraordinary given what the country had been through, you know, and given how quickly it came after peace. So, you know, that was a good first step. I'm just not sure we can get that much better than that unless something is really done about the guns. Hi, my name is Matt Adams. I'm a first year at the business school. Um, I'm joining a team this summer that will be advising uh, Ashraf Ghani and some of the other ministers. Uh, and given the situation with the warlords, how much impact can you expect to have advising at the central ministries when it seems that there's so much fragmentation? And kind of what is your advice in, in, in approaching that? Excellent question. Um, but 
sometimes when I'm in Kabul and I see the chaos in Kabul, I say, what am I doing going to Kandahar? Until we get Kabul sorted out, nothing's going to happen, you know, no, nothing positive can happen on the ground. That's my short answer to that, is I think there is so much professionalization that needs to happen in the ministries in Kabul um, that, uh, that that is not wasted time. What I would do is invite you to Kandahar. Uh, so you're welcome to come any time. And uh, uh, I think it's very, very useful to get out of Kabul and see what things are like on the ground. I would say, uh, I mean, the only... Um, caveat that I would say to that is in particular on the sort of constitution and legal institutions where I do feel like there's some spinning and inventing of institutions in Kabul that have no bearing or no relationship to what's happening in, out in the countryside. Um, but I think that's a little bit different from what you're doing. You're, it sounds like you're talking about helping to structure a ministry and make it professional um, rather than creating uh, like a body of law or something like that. Uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's very needed. My name is Don Fraser. I'm a first year master's in public policy student. And my question was more along the lines of the legal structure and how it enforces human rights. I wanted to know, I know that recently there's been a lot of talk about using the International Criminal Court to hold the warlords accountable for their crimes against humanity. Um, but is there going to be a way to hold other guilty parties accountable in the legal structure, especially since there is no legal structure right now? And how do you do that, um, either using international aid or using domestic aid? Um, yes, my question, uh, my name is Naomi Walcott, I'm also a first year student. Um, my question is probably not going to make it into my spring exercise project, but I'm still interested. Um, I noticed from the movie Life After War, um, first of all, that there were almost no women pictured, or no women filmed in the movie. Also that um, you did spend a lot of time meeting with men, uh, Afghan men, and also that some of the time you were wearing men's clothes, and I just was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your experience on the ground as a woman. Okay. Right. <laughs> on law, there is zero legal structure. Um, in Kandahar, there's, and it's something we're going to look into in, in a bit more detail, but there is a kind of ad hoc mixture of tribal uh, customary law and, I mean, there is a courthouse and a judge and stuff like that, but it's, it is, um, doesn't have much if any, impact on um, everyday life. In terms of war crimes, I mean, this again is, it's uh, the real dilemma um, because the place is still so volatile that I can't imagine any process inside Afghanistan in the next couple of years that, that, that could do anything but create more strife rather than less strife. Um, I could, you know, fantasize about a kind of two-tiered or three-tiered system where you would have uh, the worst ones going to the ICC, um, the, and everyone knows who they are, you know, I mean, that's the thing, and people are to some extent willing to speak out at the lawyer jerga, the you know, big council last summer that, that, that uh, named President Karzai transitional president, there was a lot of frank talk uh, about, you know, what are you guys doing talking about religion, look at Kabul and what you did to it and things like that. I mean, everyone knows who they are. So I could imagine, a, you know, one tier for the worst, the uh, a legal, uh, some kind of a criminal tier for the next level down and then some kind of truth and reconciliation process. But I kind of think that's a fantasy for the moment because, um, again, the, the volatility and the fear is such that people really don't, the, don't talk. I mean, we're, we're, we're launching a radio station and I've been working on a history series and with our core team of journalists. And, you know, I mean, we'll have a discussion about, well, what do you want people to learn from this show, for example? And they'll say, oh my God, but we would have to say bad things about the Mujahideen. I said, well, is it true? And they would say, we saw it with our own eyes. And I would say, you know, 
but you can't, you know, there's still, e and this is on the radio, let alone, you know, some kind of, some kind of a system, but I guess the first step is to collect evidence. I think that's the first and best way that international dollars could be spent on this, is some kind of systematic, you know, and at times secret. You know, it, could, it would have to be very discreet, but starting to collect evidence in a rigorous fashion, because I don't think that's happened. Gender, uh, yeah. I do wear men's clothes. Uh, that happened when I first went into the region before the Taliban even fell. And what I found was that there were zero women on the street at all. Not Western, not, you know, so I kind of had a choice. It was like wear Western clothes, wear Pakistani women's clothes, wear a burqa or wear men's clothes. And I wasn't gonna wear a burqa and wearing any kind of women's clothes would have collected you know, 200 people from a distance of 50 yards. So I thought, what's gonna protect me at a distance of 50 yards? And that was wearing men's clothes, including these. What I'm wearing right now are actually typical Kandahari men's clothes. Um, so, I, you know, and it worked. Now people ask me, you know, now, now I've got the habit of it. And so now people ask me, you know, why, why are you wearing men's clothes? Or, you know, oh my God, it's a woman, it's a woman. I say, yeah, yeah, it's a woman. Um, you're a boy, it's a boy. <laughs> um, I have a really odd position um, in that as a foreigner, I can be androgynous. And so I am allowed into male, it's true. Um, my mother is laughing. <laughs> She thought I was a girl. <laughs> um, recently, I have been working with a group of tribal elders who represent um, one branch of the Pashtun ethnic group. And we've worked quite a bit about, they, I sent them up to Kabul for some meetings with the president and with the US ambassador and stuff like that. And so as a result, I found myself in their council in the, the tribal council of the Gilgais, um, talking to them about what they wanted to say and how to, you know, focus it and how to hone it down and who, what, you know, what sorts of grievances they should bring to the Americans, you know, all that. And I looked around and I realized here I am running a Gilgai tribal council and I'm this chick, I'm this American girl, you know. It's like life is too surreal, especially since, uh, I would say about half the Taliban were Gilgais, and I'm sure that there were a number of Taliban in this group. And so it's like, you know, this is really wild. That's not to say that I don't work with women. We do have a number of women's programs. We have, um, as I said, an income generation program based on this kind of embroidery and beadwork. Um, We've expanded out from that to have discussion groups. This, this is a program where we actually go from house to house because, the reason you don't see any women in the movie is because you hardly see any women on the streets of Kandahar to this day, and all of them are still in burqa, all of them, except old widows, basically. Those are the only ones who would let their face show at all. Um, and so what we have found is that uh, about 90% of the women in the, in the city can't leave their homes. So if we were going to help women in a concrete way, we had to go to them. I mean, it's all very well and good to open a women's center and it would be full, but it would be full of 20% of the population. And indeed, what we have found is that a number of the projects targeting women are, um, it turns out all the women benefiting from them are Farsi speakers, um, who are a distinct minority in Kandahar, uh, who are a little bit less uh, constrained than Pashtuns are. And so because it happens to be easier, Basically, you know, people open a center, the Farsi speaking women come, and people don't make the effort to reach Pashtun women. We do, um, and now we started discussion groups in a couple of these centers, and the last one, I mean, it's absolutely dirt poor. Um, about 30 women, we had some Kuchis who are the nomads who heard about this, who are even poorer, who heard about it, and the next week were berating us, why didn't you invite us to your discussion group, you know? And we're talking about things like, you know, I mean, that day the discussion went from infant mortality and I got some appalling statistics from this group to, you know, dispute resolution, how they could constitute themselves into a kind of shura and settle their own 
disputes between them in a tribal, in a traditional fashion, to um, sell, sale of daughters, which is absolutely rampant, um, and things like that. And then we also have a weekly forum with educated women. We've got about 10 women who come in, and with them we're working on a uh, public information campaign against domestic violence. Um, we are going to work on the article of law which gives custody of children automatically to men. That as soon as a child is born, as a matter of fact, from the fifth month of pregnancy, a child belongs to its father. And that makes it impossible for women to be able to tolerate a divorce. In other words, if they're divorced by their husbands, if they do something that causes their husbands to divorce them, it's, a, it's, it's intolerable because they have to leave their children behind. So that is a very powerful tool to force the submission of women, is the threat of divorce as well as uh, domestic violence, and also a uh, petition against warlords, a petition on DDR. Before, before we uh, thank Sarah, let me point out that her mother, who she pointed to, is Professor Antonia Shays, who is a distinguished member of our faculty. So we've had two teachers from the Shays family tonight <laughs> present in the Kennedy School. And we are deeply grateful to you, Sarah. I, uh, it's an absolutely fascinating account. Uh, I, we really could go on all evening, but uh, we can't. And in that case, what we want to do is wish you well and thank you for all you've done to help educate us. So thank you very much. Thank you.